Welcome to Our Place in History. My name is Jeff Hall, and I'm the historian at the Dayton VA Medical Center. You're about to witness the remarkable story of our facility, which began as the National Asylum for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers, Central Branch. We were also known as the National Military Home, or simply as the Dayton Soldiers' Home. Construction began on our first hospital in 1868, and it was nationally recognized as a marvel of innovation and progressive design. Our grotto and elaborate gardens were nationally recognized for beauty. And I'm standing in our historic chapel, the first permanent church built by the United States government. The maimed and injured Civil War veterans quarried the stone for the church from our grounds, and the bell was cast from Confederate cannon. The events that occurred here following the Civil War have national significance. We excelled in our therapeutic environment. Our building scheme was progressive and our size was unparalleled. The Central Branch was looked upon as the mother home. We pioneered the United States government's role in social welfare programs and visitors came by the hundreds of thousands each year to witness our groundbreaking approach to veterans care. Our story begins at the close of the Civil War. The Civil War ended in 1865, and over 2,700,000 men fought for the Union. The average age of a soldier was just 25, and his chance of dying during the war was greater than one in eight. When the war began, the U.S. Army had limited experience in hospital construction. During the War of 1812 and the Mexican War, churches and convents had been used for hospitals. During the Civil War, the U.S. Sanitary Commission built 204 temporary hospitals for the war injured. The Civil War was different from previous conflicts. There was widespread use of heavy artillery. It was also the first time the rifle barrel and the repeating gun were used. The technology of warfare far exceeded the ability to care for the injuries. Amputations were often the first line of treatment. If a soldier was struck in the torso, it was often fatal. Horse-drawn ambulances carried the unfortunate soldiers to the temporary hospitals. The U.S. Sanitary Commission was charged with caring for the sick and injured. In all, over one million cases were treated. There were over 360,000 Union deaths, but only one-third were battle-related. Two-thirds of the Union deaths were due to disease. Disease was rampant because of the close quarters and the unsanitary conditions in the camps. Many of the soldiers were from rural settings and had not been exposed to common diseases. Long before the war ended, there was growing concern in the U.S. Sanitary Commission about the soldiers who survived their injuries but were permanently maimed and not employable. They knew that following previous wars in Europe, disabled veterans became beggars, and this was not acceptable for the defenders of the Union. Some people felt these permanently disabled soldiers should be cared for in federal asylums. Others felt as passionately that these veterans should be cared for in their hometown or at a state soldier's home. Everyone agreed on one thing, that the U.S. government had no prior experience with such large social welfare programs. The U.S. Sanitary Commission approached President Lincoln in 1864 about their concern for the permanently disabled soldiers. President Lincoln charged the commission to evaluate European military asylums. They found no acceptable solutions in Europe. The Sanitary Commission feared a permanent asylum would be nothing more than a poorhouse, and they favored a pension system. A compromise was reached establishing an entirely new form of health care while keeping a pension system. On March 3, 1865, President Lincoln signed legislation creating the National Asylum for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers. This was the day before President Lincoln's second inaugural address where he vowed to care for him who bore the battle, his widow and orphan. The legislation set up a board of managers. At their first meeting, General Benjamin Butler was elected president. The vision of the board of managers was to provide a home-like environment for the veterans. The Honorable Louis B. Gunkel of Dayton, Ohio, 
was elected secretary of the board. The legislation did not specify the number of asylums to be created. Louis Gunkel proposed that there be one asylum and one asylum only. It was probable that he had his hometown of Dayton, Ohio in mind because of the strong political factions of the Ohio generals. Several hours after Gunkel's proposal, the board endorsed three asylums. The selection of the sites was based on practical, political, and economic motivations. The final locations were Togus, Maine, Milwaukee, Wisconsin, and Dayton, Ohio. The founders of the Dayton Soldiers' Home were men of vision and action. In less than three months, 380 acres, including four farms and Crosby Springs, became home to nearly 1,000 disabled veterans. Chaplain T. Van Horn of the U.S. Army was detailed to lay out the grounds. The general layout features a central parade ground flanked by barracks to the west and officer quarters to the east. The hospital was set apart to the north. This layout was adapted from the latest design for large military posts. A military officer was in charge of each branch. Colonel Edwin F. Brown arrived in 1868, and he was governor of the Central Branch until 1880. In command of a New York regiment, he had been wounded several times and lost an arm at the Battle of Cedar Mountain. The street pattern of the Central Branch provided a sense of community and the desired home-like environment. It was not so for the Eastern Branch and Northwestern Branch, where veterans were crowded into one centralized structure. The veterans of the Central Branch slept 30 per floor, and each barrack was well ventilated. The Eastern Branch burned down the first year, and this was a major setback. The governor of the Northwestern Branch was still complaining 17 years after his building was built that it was inadequately heated and ventilated and had no resemblance to a home-like environment. The Central Branch quickly became the largest institution of its kind in the world. The total number of veterans cared for reached 7,146 in 1884. This accounted for 64 percent of everyone who received institutional care by the U.S. government. In contrast to the state soldier's home, military order was applied at each branch of the National Asylum. The veterans wore blue uniforms and had drills, dress parades, and inspections near the bandstand. Brass and string bands were formed at the Dayton Soldiers' Home in 1867. The bandstand was built in 1871, and guest musicians included John Philip Sousa. A concert was performed every evening. It ended with the firing of the evening cannon to signal lights out. A civilian bandmaster led the band. The director of the U.S. Marine Band, Captain William Henry Saddleman, is credited with saying the home band outrivaled in quality of performance every other government band but the one he conducted. From then on, the home band was known as the second best government band in the country. The officers of the Central Branch firmly believe that men everywhere are happier when they have something to do. The innovations of the Dayton Soldiers' Home include rehabilitative workshops. The veterans were taught a trade in order to become independent of the soldiers' home. Early workshops included blacksmithing, bookbinding, knitting, shoemaking, and telegraph instruction. The blue uniforms for all the branches were manufactured here, except the caps and undershirts. Veterans were taught bookkeeping and how to operate a business, such as the home store. Other branches were to establish workshops later, but no branch matched the variety and success of the Dayton Soldiers' Home. A school was started in 1868. The founders made a point of reporting that black veterans who had no prior access to formal education were learning to read and write. Our school was racially integrated. 
Some veterans were employed in our large dairy and cattle operation. Veterans were responsible for the daily operations of the home, including food preparation. This was the first large-scale federal rehabilitative program. Veterans ate in shifts up to 2,000 at a time. Black and white veterans lived and dined together with no apparent distinction to race or color. We were the first racially integrated federal facility. Home Hospital was a marvel of innovation and design. A circular issued by the Surgeon General's office in April 1867 was a great advance in hospital construction. Home Hospital exceeded those principles by using a three-story design with a steam-powered elevator, an operating room, large towers for water closets and bathrooms, and bay windows on each ward to aid in ventilation. It had indoor plumbing and steam heat. Home Hospital was one of the finest structures of its kind in the United States and the only branch hospital adapted for the treatment of all classes of diseases. The original 300-bed building was enlarged with additional wards to bring the total capacity to 840 beds. Our physician training program began in 1884 and has continued without interruption through today. Mrs. Emma Miller arrived with the first veterans in 1867 and served here nearly 50 years. She was the first matron of the hospital and superintendent of the General Depot where the clothing was manufactured. The chapel walk is a shaded path connecting the historic chapel and home hospital. Some of the original trees still remain along the walk and can be used to line up the original walkway. The home chapel is the oldest building in the historic district. Construction began in 1868 and the chapel was dedicated in 1870. It was announced in the New York Times that our home chapel was the first permanent church built by the U.S. government. Our founders firmly believed the chapel was an intricate part of the home-like environment. The Protestant and Catholic services were held in home chapel during the early years until the Catholic chapel was built. This provided the unique experience of worship and harmony in the same church. A bell tower with high spire roof was added in 1876. It contains the 2,539 pound bell made by the Manili and Kimberly foundries of Troy, New York. This advertisement for the related Manili bells ran in a Dayton, Ohio journal shortly before our bell was purchased. Our bell is engraved 1776-1876, Centennial Bell, made for the Church of the National Soldiers Home at Dayton, Ohio, from cannon captured from the enemy during the War of the Rebellion. Manili and Kimberly cast one additional Centennial Bell several weeks after ours was cast. That bell replaced the Liberty Bell in Independence Hall. The original shingles were made of slate and featured a cross design. The seal of the national home was displayed in stained glass over the pulpit. President Ulysses S. Grant spoke here on October 3, 1871. One of the guest ministers who frequented the church included Bishop Milton Wright, the father of the Wright brothers. Chaplain William Earnshaw arrived with the first veterans in September of 1867 and obtained approval for the construction of the chapel. The Dayton Soldiers' Home was the national headquarters for the Grand Army of the Republic, GAR. Chaplain Earnshaw was elected Commander-in-Chief of the GAR on June 7, 1879. He was the first to hold that position under the rank of Major General. His last words were, tell the veterans I loved them all. Federally built chapels are an integral part of VA medical centers today, as well as all branches of the military and military academies. The chapel was closed in 1998 due to safety concerns about its floor, but efforts are underway by the American Veterans Heritage Center, AVHC, to repair the chapel and reopen it to the public. In 1896, a large pipe organ was built into the northwest corner next to the altar. It is the first electric organ in Montgomery County. In 1898, the Chapel of the Good Shepherd was built for Catholic services. Over 7,000 veterans were present at that time, and we needed two chapels. 
Soldiers Home Memorial Hall was built in 1880. Nothing was too good for the Civil War veterans. The furnishings and equipment were surpassed by few opera houses in the country. The hall had seating for 1,500 people. It used gas, light, and steam heat. Memorial Hall was located between Home Chapel and the Headquarters Building. We were an important stop on all cross-country tours by show companies. Up to 34 show companies performed at the home each year. An elaborate Civil War panorama decorated the theater walls. The hall had two presidential boxes with plush walnut chairs. Entertainment was provided to many presidents of the United States who visited the home. The offices of the governor, treasurer, and secretary of the home were on the first floor of the headquarters. The Putnam Library originally occupied the second floor. If you look closely, you can see a veteran sunning himself out the second floor window. The chapel before the addition of the bell tower is in the background. Mrs. Mary Lowell Putnam donated 11,000 books to the central branch starting in 1868. Her signature is on the inside covers of the original books. The library is named in honor of Mary's beloved son, Lieutenant William Putnam, who died at the Battle of Ball's Bluff while trying to save a wounded comrade. Lieutenant Putnam's portrait hung over a massive walnut bookcase that was made by the veterans. A wreath was hung over the portrait each year on the anniversary of his death. It was one of the finest libraries in Ohio. The porch that surrounded the building was removed sometime after 1930. In 1891, the Quartermaster Building was renovated to accommodate the vast amount of books donated by Mrs. Putnam. The first floor was a reading area. English and German newspapers kept the veterans updated on world events. The patient library is currently the headquarters of the American Veterans Heritage Center, AVHC. The AVHC is supporting the restoration of four of the historic Soldiers Home buildings. The amusement hall, currently known as the Liberty House, was built in 1870. The upper portion was the quarters for the home band. This building was renovated into the treasurer's residence after the clubhouse was built in 1881. The clubhouse had billiard tables, meeting rooms, and an upper hall for veteran organizations such as the GAR. The grotto is next to the upper lake in this lithograph. It was a paradise of flowers and fountains. The veterans created intricate displays in the flowers. The tiger mound was displayed in the 1870s. The mound was at least 25 feet in height and the tiger was comprised entirely of flowers. Fountains and walkways were behind the mound and a butterfly was usually displayed on the backside of the mound. The entrance into the grotto was announced with a stone arch. The waterfall at the right side of the stairs still flows today. The stone arch was replaced with this structure around 1900. A glass dome greenhouse was built in the 1870s. Early construction of Memorial Hall can be seen in the background next to the chapel. The greenhouse dome was at least 50 feet in height. A fine fountain named the Water Waste was inside the greenhouse dome. Also built in the 1870s, the Martindale Greenhouse was named in honor of General John Henry Martindale, a commander in many of the hard-fought battles, including Cold Harbor. He succeeded Louis Gunkel as secretary to the Board of Managers. This greenhouse was built in 1897. It was torn down in the 1970s due to concern about deterioration. Our campus had numerous animal exhibits long before there were zoos. We had a monkey house, an alligator pond, trained bears, and deer. This artist took the liberty of adding elephants by the pond. There is no evidence that we had elephants. But we did have alligators, a gift from a local merchant. The pond was heated with steam lines from the conservatory. And we had a nursery for baby alligators. The alligators were with us well into the 20th century. And this is one of our bears. I wouldn't want the job of feeding him. Several acres were enclosed with a wire fence as a deer park. An old soldier, who was once the deer keeper for the King of Prussia, kept the deer.
The Dayton Soldiers' Home was a major tourist attraction beginning in the 1870s. Train excursions were organized to the home. This flyer boasts of walking gardens, flowers, fountains, lakes, and the finest church in the land. This advertisement from the 1880s states we are visited by more people than any other traveler's resort west of the Allegheny Mountains. The Third Street Gate was one of the main entrances to the campus. Veteran guides were attired in the uniform of the home and designated with a badge. The Third Street Gatekeeper's Lodge was built in 1868. It is located at Third Street and Gettysburg Avenue. Visitors were greeted with a graceful salute. The home hotel was constructed in 1879 to accommodate the visitors. Mrs. Emma Miller, the hospital matron, was the innkeeper. Home hotel included 20 guest rooms and a restaurant. Treats on the 1884 menu included nuts, soda water, and ice cream. Proceeds were used to equip the home band and pay professional show companies. The hospitality room was an alternative dining area. Dining here was enlivened with music from the home band. Visitors enjoyed many attractions, including boat rides on the Middle Lake. The women in the foreground are waiting for a boat ride on the McPherson. The three-masted Garfield is anchored in the background. The Garfield served as a lifeboat when the ironclad Merrimack sunk the Cumberland. Naval warfare would soon be changed forever. The Garfield was in our Middle Lake for nearly 30 years. This is the McPherson with Memorial Hall and Home Chapel in the background. The home received so many visitors that entrepreneurs set up attractions next to the soldiers' home, including the Battle of Gettysburg Cyclorama. The Cyclorama was located across Gettysburg Avenue by the lake. This area later became Lakeside Amusement Park. The Cyclorama featured a 360-degree painting of the Battle of Gettysburg. This view shows an ammunition explosion near the 28th Massachusetts Infantry. Swans graced our middle lake by the Swan House. Visitors who enjoyed ice skating on the home lakes included Orville Wright and his sister Catherine. This is the Swan House today. The Dayton Soldiers Home was a haven for veterans and a resort for travelers. It was a place like no other. And the veterans cherished the attention, with the weapons of war becoming backdrops for souvenir photographs. Some of our black veterans with top hat and cane in hand are on the right side of this photograph. The Dayton National Cemetery began in 1867 as the home cemetery. Originally, graves were marked with wooden headboards that had been painted white. Home Hospital stands in the background. A funeral tunnel connected the hospital with the cemetery grounds. Inside the funeral tunnel were chambers and doors. A long-standing tradition is to decorate the graves on Memorial Day. The graves were decorated with a cross or a wreath. This tradition continues today with American flags placed by the Girl Scouts and the Boy Scouts. A 30-foot tall Greek Revival column was secured for a soldier's monument through the efforts of Louis Gunkel. This marble column with ornamental cap was designed by famed architect Benjamin Henry Latrobe and it previously adorned the facade of the Bank of Pennsylvania. Mr. Latrobe also designed the White House and the Capitol in Washington, D.C. A 10-foot statue of a soldier at parade rest is on the pinnacle. The four military figures at the base represent the infantry, the cavalry, artillery, and navy. The Soldiers' Monument stands as an everlasting tribute from the men and officers of the Central Branch to their fallen comrades. Six recipients of the Medal of Honor are interred at the National Cemetery. This is the highest award for valor in action against the enemy force that can be bestowed upon an individual in the armed forces. Two governors of the home are buried here, General Marcina Patrick and Colonel Jerome Thomas, as well as Mrs. Emma Miller, the hospital matron. Upon her death in 1914, Mrs. Miller was the first woman in the United States to be buried with full military honors. 
Brown Hospital was the last structure commissioned by the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers. It opened in 1930 with 900 acute care beds. This was the same year that the Veterans Administration was formed by combining the National Home for Disabled Volunteer Soldiers with the Veterans Bureau and the Bureau of Pensions. As healthcare technology advanced, the focus shifted away from providing a home-like environment to become a modern healthcare facility. In 1989, the Veterans Administration became the Department of Veterans Affairs. The nine-story patient tower in the center of this photograph opened in 1992. The National Asylum did not receive any funds from Congress for the first nine years. It was financed largely from a fund in the War Department with unclaimed soldiers' pay and fines. During these years, the Central Branch was the only shining star. We showed that the federal government has a role in social welfare and could be successful. If Dayton did not do it right, Congress never would have funded the system and social welfare would have been provided by the states and local poorhouses. Without the groundbreaking success that you have just witnessed, federal programs that we have today, such as the VA, Social Security, and Medicare, may never have started because they would have been outside the scope of the federal government. The Department of Veterans Affairs continues to reflect the desires of a grateful nation to care for the men and women who have defended our country. The buildings of the Dayton VA Historic District are a testament to the vision and enthusiasm of our founders and their major role in establishing what has become the largest integrated healthcare system in the United States.